Well, I think we can go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, I'd like to introduce myself as our opener, and then I will introduce our speakers in a moment. But before I do that, I'd like to let everybody on the webinar know that if you are interested in accessing the live transcript and captioning function on the session today, you can go to the bottom of the screen where the live transcript button is um, and change your settings if you'd like to see it. I will also let you know that we're gonna handle question and answer by using the Q&A function of this webinar. There's no chat function. So as you think of questions, please type them into the Q&A uh, you can turn that on by going to the button at the bottom of your screen and putting those questions in there. I'll be holding the questions mainly till the end after all of our speakers are, are, are finished, and then we can handle those um, at that time. And we are recording this session so that if you'd like to watch it later or let other folks know about it, it will be available. So thank you so much for joining us on this important day, important week to commemorate the legacy of Dr. King's work. My name is Sarah Burgard. I'm a professor of sociology and I'm the director of the Population Studies Center here at ISR. And uh, the Population Studies Center has been around since the early 1960s and is a collection of multidisciplinary population scientists who are interested in um, the behavior of groups and the implications that has for social equity. And in organizing this year's event, we wanted to heighten awareness and stimulate conversation around social science approaches to the built environment in our cities and communities and the implications for social justice in America. So yesterday, um, some of you were able to join us in a screening of the film Urbanized, which is a documentary that helped to start the conversation by discussing the different experiences of urbanization and de-urbanization that affect our own and our neighbors' chances to live productive and healthy lives. And you can still watch the film if you have a UMich Logren, the U of M library has it on the Canopy streaming feature. That link is available in the invitation that's on the U of M events calendar, um, or you can reach out to one of us and we can give that, that link to you. So the film addressed the challenges of balancing housing, mobility, public space, civic engagement, economic development, and environmental justice in communities all over the world and a diverse range of urban design projects that have arisen to address them. Today, we're going to hear reflections on some of the themes of the film from our colleagues who are PSC or PSC adjacent scholars doing cutting edge social scientific work to understand and intervene on the inequities we see by race and other persistent social dividing lines in the United States. So I'm gonna briefly introduce each of our speakers who will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll have Q&A at the end of all four. We're first going to hear from Lydia Willadon. I'm sorry, Lydia, if I mispronounced your last name, who's a doctoral student in sociology and public policy here at Michigan. And Lydia will talk about the Detroit Metro Area Community Study, or DMAX, and their recent findings on home repair needs and housing cost burden. Our next speaker will be Dr. Alexandra Murphy, Assistant Professor of Sociology and Affiliate of PSC, who will talk about transportation insecurity, what it is, who experiences it, how we measure it, and what about the built environment shapes it. We'll then hear from Charles Williams II, a doctoral student in social work and sociology, and pastor of the historic King Solomon Baptist Church in Detroit and Michigan Chair of the National Action Network who will talk about action on social and environmental justice issues in the region. And we'll be finished, um, finished off, uh, rounded off by Professor Kristen Seafelt, who's an Associate Professor of Social Work and the Associate Director of Poverty Solutions here at the University of Michigan, who will speak on their Investing in Us project, which focuses on centering Detroiters voices and charting a vision for the city. So I'm extremely grateful to all of you for tuning in today and to our esteemed group of panelists. And I'm gonna turn it over now first to Lydia. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. Can everyone hear me? Just give a thumbs up. Okay. Let me share my screen. I first just want to thank Sarah and those at the Pop Studies Center and at ISR for convening this gathering today. Um, I am 
pleased to be able to talk about the work that DMAX has done to understand the um, housing needs of Detroiters, uh, especially thinking about the legacy of Dr. King and his work on racial injustice and specifically the struggle, the struggle around access to fair and quality housing. Um, I think that, that there's evidence that I'll share with you today that that struggle absolutely lives on, has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so you know, this feels particularly timely. I want to start by just orienting you all a little bit to the work of DMAX, if you are not familiar with our project. Um, DMAX is also called the Detroit Metro Area Community Study. Um, and we are, slides will advance, there we go, a longitudinal study of Detroit residents that started um, as the brainchild or the really the reboot of the Detroit Area Study. Um, that was led by and is led by uh, Jeff Morinoff, who is the former director of the Pot Study Center, and Elizabeth Gerber, who's a professor of public policy. Um, and I just want to acknowledge our small but scrappy team of researchers. There's um, just about six of us who have been pushing this work forward. So I just want to give a little shout out. Um, DMAX launched initially in 2016, and from this slide, what you can see is we did four waves of data collection in the first uh, three years of our existence, and then dramatically increased our data collection in response to COVID-19. Um, we are regularly surveying a broad representative group of Detroit residents about their communities. And really since March, 2020, we pivoted to a more rapid response um, data collection process and have collected now eight waves of data um, just since the COVID-19 pandemic began in March, 2020. So we are sitting on an incredible um, richness of data that follows uh, a longitudinal panel of around 2000 Detroit residents. And I'd be happy to talk more about um, that data and its availability at the end if people have questions. DMAX is um, you know, a, a classic social science uh, research study. We use a random address-based sample of Detroit households to recruit a representative sample. We recruit residents by mail and then follow up with our respondents over time um, by email, text, and phone. And we also used to have a uh, direct outreach campaign that has been put on hold um, thanks to COVID and some face-to-face uh, -face restrictions. Our survey is available in English, Spanglish, nope, English, Spanish, Bangla, and Arabic uh, in an effort to um, be able to communicate to the, to the full diversity of Detroit residents and especially get at some of the emerging immigrant communities in the city. And then we weight our survey to match the estimated distribution of gender, age, race, and education in the city um, so that our, our data can be viewed as truly really representative. One of the things that I just like to brag about when it comes to DMAX is our incredibly healthy response, uh, response rates, which I wouldn't normally talk about except this is an ISR presentation. Um, and so the fact that we have about 70% of our respondents who we reach out to in any given wave respond to our survey um, is just a major point of pride for our team um, and also means that our data we're able to pick up people repeatedly over time, um, which with the dynamic nature of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think has been especially important in terms of understanding how individual circumstances have changed over time. So we have a lot of exciting longitudinal work that we are working on um, to try to tell that story and especially that story in one very specific place, the city of Detroit. And this just gives you a sense of the type of data that we collect through DMAX. Obviously, in the most recent waves, we've had a heavy focus on the impacts of COVID. I also would be remiss to not mention that um, we are partially funded by the National Institute of Health and a collaboration with some of our um, partners in the School of, um, the School of Public Health. 
And so we've greatly expanded some of our um, COVID research in response to and in collaboration with those partners. But beyond the public health realm, we collect data on a whole range of um, different social, economic, um, and uh, public policy topics. Um, and in included in that are trying to understand some of the city's priorities, how residents respond to city priorities, um, and the priorities that the residents themselves have for how they'd like to see Detroit change over time. But today I wanna to focus specifically on some of our data that we've collected on housing hardship and home repair needs in Detroit. Um, there have been, a, there has been a growing amount of research in the last, um, at least certainly decade, maybe even shorter than that, that has put housing um, center stage in terms of the fight around equity and um, access and inequality in, in the United States. And some of that work was led by Matt Desmond at Princeton, who's focused a light on uh, the role of evictions. Um, there's also a long-term conversation on the lack of affordability, both who's able to afford home ownership, and then just generally who is spending more than um, what we would think of as, an, as a reasonable amount of money on their uh, housing payments. And then I think most recently with COVID-19, an area that has uh, gotten increasing attention is the topic of missed payments. Who is going into debt because of their uh, housing costs and what is the relationship between um, landlords and tenants especially, but also homeowners and banks who own their mortgages in terms of failure to pay because of some of the economic outfall from the pandemic. And in Detroit, these topics are all very important. You know, we see that when we survey our uh, residents, about 4% report that they've been evicted in the past 12 months, which should give you pause in part because there have generally been eviction moratoriums. And while 4% seems like a small proportion of any population, that could aggregate up to being almost 1,400 renter households. So you know, that is a substantial number of people and of households who are possibly being uh, forcibly moved. We also find that around um, one in five residents say that they are spending more, uh, between a third and half of their income on their housing payments while one in eight say that their housing costs exceed half of their monthly income. So you know, we definitely see lots of evidence that folks are spending more than what we would think of as a reasonable amount of their, of their income on housing, whether that is their mortgage payment or their rental payments. And then finally, we also see that there is accumulating debt among households in terms of who's missing payments. Almost a third of our residents um, told us that they've missed at least one housing payment in the last 12 months. Sorry, that's of those who are making payments, so not those who have paid off their mortgages. And that's especially true of people who are unemployed and of parents with children. And so when we think about what are the long-term impacts of COVID-19, especially on individual wealth and home stability, we have some of these uh, already at-risk populations that are falling behind. But I want to talk to you today um, instead about what I think of as um, a more hidden dimension of the housing, um, housing inequality and struggle in the city of Detroit, and that's home repair. 81% of Detroiters say that they've needed at least one home repair in the last 12 months. And when we look at the different types of problems that residents tell us that they have, some of these seem relatively common and you know, things that you find in cities, but some of them speak to a greater level of demand, a greater level of need and um, the persistence of housing conditions that um, very few of us, I think, could live with. You know, 5% of households are telling us they have experienced a lack of running water. 8% um, say they've had no hot water. Um, and so 
when we think about these different types of home repair needs, this is really a hidden epidemic in terms of the types of housing quality that Detroiters have access to. And the city has recently launched some programs that pull from federal government ARPA funds to try to address the needs of home repair. Specifically, they recently launched a $30 million Renew Detroit program that provides home repair grants specifically to low-income senior citizens and homeowners with disability. But what I wanna to suggest to you today is that those funds are not enough. Um, and they also perhaps miss the, the populations that are most at need. Um, and so when we think about the 750 homes annually that are going to be touched by the Repair Detroit program, we also have to think about those who don't have access to those funds and where their support is going to come. So when we look specifically at who is experiencing inadequate quality housing, which the um, American Housing Study defines as housing in which uh, residents live with exposed wires or electrical problems, broken furnace or heating problems, or a lack of hot or running water in the past year, what we find is that 13% of Detroit households could be considered as living in inadequate quality housing. And this is much higher than the 3.2% that the American Housing Study estimates based on the metro area. So when we think about the distinction between Detroit and its, and its suburbs, um, one of the things that gets missed if we aggregate those together is the need for home repair specifically in the city of Detroit. And that 13% equals almost 100,000 residents and 37,000 households. So going back to Renew Detroit and its um, 750 households that it expects to treat, obviously we're missing a lot of people. There's also an incredible amount of inequity in terms of who's facing uh, home repair needs. We see that white Detroiters are half as likely to live in inadequate quality housing. Um, similarly, low and moderate income households are twice as likely as upper income households to live in inadequate quality housing. And really shockingly, one in five households with children live in inadequate housing conditions. So when we think about this renewed Detroit um, program really focusing on seniors and those with disabilities, I'd like to suggest that there are a lot of people who similarly have needs who are going to be missed in those um, buckets of population. And then finally, uh, Renew Detroit is a program for homeowners. And unfortunately, the reality is that a lot of renters are the ones saddled with inadequate quality housing. Um, and they are left out of this, these funding programs and also um, often have little recourse against their landlords when it comes to uh, making requests for home repairs and having those requests met. And so what we find is that when we ask renters how responsive their landlords were to repairs, only 18% of renters overall said that their landlords were not, um, not responsive. But when we look at those who live in inadequate quality housing, 38% told us that um, they were not able to get their landlords to make repairs. And so again, I wanna suggest that it's not just that these programs are targeting maybe the wrong population, but they're also missing this major area of need, which is renter households. I'd love to talk more about this and to tell you guys about other findings from uh, DMAX, but I'm gonna turn it over to my other panelists. I would love to uh, share more with you. You can always go to our website, detroitsurvey.umich.edu. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Lydia. We're gonna turn it over to Dr. Murphy. All right, thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen. All right. Um, well, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be part of this panel and part of this discussion. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some work on transportation insecurity in the built environment. And I want to acknowledge before getting started, uh, uh, various team members on this project that have played key roles in, in different parts, which is Alex Goldworth, uh, Jamie Griffin, Karina McDonald-Lopez, and Natasha Pukalskis. Um, so I want to begin by asking everyone in the audience, my fellow panelists, a set of questions. And for all these questions, you have three response options. You can respond with often, sometimes, or never. 
The first question I want to ask is, in the past 30 days, how often did you have to arrive someplace early and wait because of the schedule of the bus, train, or person giving you a ride? The second question is, in the past 30 days, how often have you not been able to leave the house, and this isn't because of COVID, but because you have problems with transportation? And the third question is, in the past 30 days, how often have you worried about inconveniencing your friends, family, or neighbors because you needed help with transportation? Based on qualitative research with low-income families in urban, suburban, and rural areas in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Chicago, my research team and I have come to learn that these are just some of the symptoms of what we call transportation insecurity, which we define as a condition in which one is unable to move regularly from, from place to place in a safe or timely manner due to a lack of resources needed for transportation. And this is a, a, a condition that can have dire consequences for people. It can make it difficult for people to look for work, to access social services, to move to safer neighborhoods, to buy groceries, to visit friends, and to vote. And while transportation insecurity can shape people's ability to access destinations, our qualitative research reveals that it has other consequences and can manifest itself in the lives of everyday people in three particular ways. So one is materially, and these are the kind of manifestations that can be physically observed, and they indicate whether people can get around in a safe or timely manner. And so here we see people who are transportation insecure spend a long time planning trips, a long time taking complicated time-consuming uh, commutes, and sometimes they can't travel at all. A second manifestation that we see is relational, and these uh, pertain to social strains that come from either using your social networks to get around, or they come from not being able to uh, see other people because of transportation problems. And then finally, the third manifestation that we've observed is that whether you're stuck at home or you're managing strained relationships, or you're experiencing social isolation, all of this can really take an emotional toll and a psychological toll on people. And while these experiences are things that transportation insecure people negotiate constantly, they and transportation insecurity itself has largely been overlooked and understudied. And we hypothesize that one reason for this is that researchers have lacked adequate measurement tools to capture this phenomenon. In its absence, scholars have largely used proxy measures like car ownership or neighborhood accessibility scores. And while these measures may be correlated with transportation insecurity, they're not always able to accurately identify people experiencing insecurity. So for example, car ownership measures can pick up people who have cars, but they can't pick up people who uh, may experience insecurity because they can't pay for repairs or can't pay for gas and they can't use them. And neighborhood accessibility scores uh, can't pick up people who live in accessible neighborhoods who can't get around because they don't feel safe waiting at the bus stop or they don't have the physical health to walk to the places they need to go. So lacking a single valid measure of transportation insecurity, this condition has largely been invisible. Um, and so we've not been able to understand how many people and who in the US experience it, what causes it, what its consequences may be, and what kinds of policies and programs we can be using to address it. And so to address this, for the last five years or so, my research team and I have been working to develop what we call the Transportation Security Index, which is a measure that is modeled after the Food Security Index and it's, uh, it's a measure that captures the experience of transportation insecurity at the individual level, regardless of geography or mode of transit. In designing this measure, as I said, we use the food security index as our model, and we used our qualitative research to craft questions that directly tap into the various symptoms of transportation insecurity, like those that were expressed in the questions I posed to you earlier. Things like arriving early and waiting because of transportation problems, being unable to leave your house, worrying about inconveniencing friends and family because you need uh, rides, for example. The index is comprised of 16 questions and it's been validated on a nationally representative sample. And using the index and this data, we are now getting a picture of how many people and who in the US is experiencing this. And what we're seeing is that uh, we find nearly one in four adults over the age of 25 in the US is experiencing some form of transportation insecurity. And that 16% are experiencing marginal to low insecurity, but 8% are experiencing moderate to severe. If we look at what groups specifically are likely to experience transportation insecurity, we find that the lower a person's income, the more likely they are to experience transportation insecurity. Indeed, more than half of individuals below the poverty line experience some form of insecurity, and they're much more likely to experience high insecurity than those above it. If we look at what racial and ethnic groups are experiencing insecurity, we see that non-white households are more likely to experience insecurity than whites. And that those who are classified as other race and ethnicity are experiencing far higher rates of transportation insecurity than other groups. 
Looking at people with disabilities, we see that disabled people are roughly twice as likely to experience lower marginal insecurity than those who are not disabled, and that uh, they're three times more likely to experience moderate or severe insecurity than those who are not disabled. In terms of where we're seeing insecurity, the geography, we find that urban residents are far more likely to experience insecurity, about 40%, whereas only 13% of rural residents experience insecurity. And this finding uh, is counterintuitive and it's something we're, we're exploring a bit more and happy to talk about in Q&A about our thoughts on why this, what, we, what explains this. But in short, what we're finding in, in our data is that a sizable number of people in the US experience transportation insecurity and that it's most prevalent among those groups who are most likely to experience other kinds of hardship, right? With housing, food, and so on. And that this likely exacerbates those hardships. So what we might ask is, uh, is shaping and causing transportation insecurity? And while this is an empirical question itself and one that our team is gonna be investigating, certainly the built environment plays a significant role here. So the built environment of the US, specifically how sprawling it is, low density, and the design of roads is built for cars. And so it can be very difficult to get to place to place uh, in the places you need to go in a safe or timely manner without a car. And this is perhaps best exemplified if we turn our attention to the suburbs, which were explicitly designed for people who have cars and where the majority of low-income Americans now live. In many of these places, zoning, sprawl and density put significant distance between where people live and where they need to go to work, shop and play. And this makes getting around by foot, makes getting around by walking almost impossible. This is worsened by a lack of sidewalks in these places, as evidenced here by a map of a suburb outside of Pittsburgh where I conducted ethnographic field work, um, studying the lives of the suburban poor. And just to note, um, this is a, a very large place. It's 19 square miles. And so you see there's very, very few sidewalks that exist. Um, and when they do, um, oftentimes these sidewalks look like what people call sidewalks to nowhere. So you have part of a sidewalk abutting property, and then it stops when a new private property begins, um, thus not creating co a continuous path for people to walk on. And this can force people to walk in the streets, which can put them at, at risk of being hit by cars. Um, and if the built environment makes walking almost nearly impossible in this space, it also makes taking public transit very difficult. And this is because sprawl and low density make it impossible to provide adequate, affordable public transit. And moreover, when public funding for transportation is reduced, these are often the places that are vulnerable to experiencing the most cuts because it's so expensive to provide service in these kinds of sprawling places. So again, taking for instance, the same suburb that I, I shared with you before, um, this is a slide of transportation cuts that have happened um, over a decade period. And as you can see across 10 years, public transit was reduced dramatically. The solid lines in here are full-time service. Um, and across a decade, this is a place that, that had semi-okay transportation um, to one that became a transportation, a transit desert. The built environment in these kinds of spaces can also make it difficult for people to take Ubers, informal taxis like jitneys and get rides from friends and family who, have to, who often have to drive very large distances, and, which is timely and cost prohibitive. As one woman um, in the suburb uh, reported to me, it cost 10 to $15 alone for her to get a jitney to come out from the city to her house to pick her up. And that didn't uh, cover the cost of the getting to her destination and returning. And so often using these sort of informal strategies can be more expensive in these spaces. Of course, as we saw, the largest share of transportation insecure people in the nation don't live in the suburbs, they live in cities. But here too, these same features of the built environment can treat can shape transportation insecurity. So here we can think about uh, James Robertson, a Detroit resident who was featured in a 2015 Free Press article that detailed how he had to walk 21 miles a day round trip because he had no car and there was no bus service that could take him from his home in Detroit to his job in the suburbs. Now you might ask, um, is car ownership a panacea to transportation insecurity? Could we just give everyone cars and that could, would that solve transportation insecurity? Well, as this slide shows, you know, not surprisingly, car ownership can be a buffer to experiencing transportation insecurity. Yet it's also the case that that's not true for everyone or in all cases. 18% of car owners experience transportation insecurity. And this can happen when they can't afford insurance, when they can't afford repairs or gas and things and the like and can't use their cars. Moreover, more cars for everyone introduces other kinds of problems relevant to social justice, like environmental harms. At the same time, there have been some, um, especially uh, urban planner Evelyn Blumenberg outside of UCLA, 
who have argued that it is low income people who are precisely the people who need cars, given the kinds of jobs and schedules they have and their use of social networks um, to make ends meet. In fact, she's argued that what this country has is not necessarily a spatial mismatch problem, but she's argued that we have a modal mismatch problem, which is that the very people uh, who can afford cars are the ones who need them the least, and that the people who uh, need cars can't afford them. So the point I just want to end on is that transportation insecurity, what we're finding is a condition that's faced by a sizable number of Americans, and it has very real implications for their ability to obtain opportunity and be fully integrated in society. The built environment is playing a, a significant role shaping this and finding solutions, especially given just how hard it is to, to change the built environment are not gonna be easy, but finding ways to move people from transportation insecurity to transportation security is gonna be vital in the future for people and communities to flourish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. I'm going to turn it over now to Charles, and I just wanted to remind everybody on the on the webinar that if you have a question, you can go to the bottom of your screen and hit that Q&A button and enter it, and we'll be able to see it, and I can field that at the end of the presentation. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> there we go. First of all, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Charles Williams, uh, pastor of historic King Solomon Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan, chairman of the National Action Network, doc student in sociology and uh, social work um, here at University of Michigan, and certainly thankful to uh, be invited to be a part of this uh, grand conversation. You know, um, when watching Urbanized, uh, I think that there were a couple of things that went through my mind. One, I think the question, uh, that we often have tension with is, uh, is urbanization uh, overall better for society? Uh, question that's very challenging, specifically, I live in an urban center, a uh, pastor in an urban center, and uh, certainly understand the woes of uh, living in an urban center. But thinking about King uh, in the time uh, where we are really just bombarded with so much. Uh, we think about what King would say, and I thought maladjusted his comments uh, that he made to the American Psychological Association uh, just fit right in. And so I'd quote him by saying, but I say to you, my friends, there are certain things in our nation and in the world which I am proud to be maladjusted, and which I hope all men of good uh, will, will be maladjusted until the good societies realize. I say very honestly that I never intend to become adjusted to the segregation and discrimination. Uh, I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend uh, to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few, leave millions of God's children smothering in an airtight cage of poverty, the midst of an affluent society. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism, to self-defeating effects of physical violence. And, and, and listening to his words and, and watching Urbanize and thinking about our research, I research black churches, uh, particularly in urban centers and how they help uh, bring the social safety net closer as well as bring uh, public health uh, 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 interventions uh, closer to individuals who particularly uh, suffer from disparities. We see that the COVID-19 pandemic has produced in so many ways, uh, so many of these things, uh, so, many of these, so many of these issues in a way that we haven't seen them before. Um, and so I, I think in thinking about Dr. King, I think about uh, not only uh, uh, the people who live there now, but I think about the, the, the tribes, uh, the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi, the Ashinaabe nations. Uh, and I think about this moment in a very uh, mystical sense 
uh, only because uh, this is unlike something that many of us uh, have never experienced before. I was reading David Abrams, phenomenologist, ecologist, um, UC Berkeley Center for Humans and Nature, uh, suggests we have to drop underneath the clatter of our technologies, the bluster of our politics, in order to listen into the depths of the spreading silence. We need to listen into the that silence beyond the words and begin to respond with our voices and with our actions carefully, creatively, not being afraid to sound a little strange or act a little odd or to speak in ways that curiously different, to be perhaps more than a little outrageous or even out of our minds, which is to say out of the self-enclosed interior hermet hermetically sealed human minds that we were educated to believe in. And, and so I think about what does the land have to say and what do its people have to say? Understanding that uh, we have always had this constant war between uh, city and, 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 and pastoral nomads, hunter gatherers. You've always had this clash between those who have uh, lorded over the land, controlled the land versus those uh, who have uh, worked to be one and to follow the land and listen to the land. Uh, I, I, I think about one young man who's a Costa Rican tribal leader who explains that this pandemic uh, is almost rooted in uh, the unbalancing uh, that we're quite honestly contributing to, uh, whether it be the environment uh, or whether we, the way we treat uh, the environment, the, the, the people uh, of the earth, uh, or whether it be the, the way that we treat uh, the earth itself. So COVID-19 is, is kind of like, to me, an uh, almost an opportunity for us to listen opportunity for us to listen differently than we have before. Uh, it was COVID-19 that brought out some of the most polarizing and uh, that, that we've ever seen before under the administration under Donald Trump and the politicizing of, uh, of the pandemic itself. Uh, January 6th, right, uh, the governor of Michigan uh, being plotted on to be kidnapped uh, racism, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, George Floyd pops up. All this pops up in the midst of COVID-19. What is it saying? All right, Asian hate, uh, where we have a president who proclaimed at one point in time that this was a China flu. But the pandemic affected all people. 847,000 deaths to date. Uh, nationwide, Black Americans experienced 14% or almost 15%, uh, represent almost 15% of those who have died from the pandemic, as we only represent about 12% of the population. What is the pandemic saying? What is the COVID-19 pandemic speaking? What is it saying from the land? What is it saying from the people? So I, I would suggest that this pandemic has brought to us some things that We've, never, we've always, in, in, from the community perspective, always have cried for, always have fought for, always have asked for, and we were always told it was never possible it could happen. It was always told it was never possible for DTM to, DTE to uh, do a moratorium on shutoffs. They always said they never could do that. It's not possible. We can't do it. The pandemic happened. People died. The world stopped and DTE provided a moratorium on shutoffs. They said to us, we marched for water shutoffs. They said, there's no possible way you'll ever get a moratorium on water shutoffs. Do you know it's still a moratorium on water shutoffs to this very day? And actually the governor, doesn't, the governor or the mayor don't even have the political will to turn it back around. Uh, Lydia made it very clear that there, there was a landlord tenant moratorium, as many of you all very much well know, that moratorium is being backed off of Wayne County still has a moratorium on their tax foreclosures. Uh, the minimum wage uh, 
did not necessarily increase just because of the policy that was put in place. Uh, because we found out that people who make minimum wage, they don't stop working when everybody else goes home. Uh, overall wages ended up having to increase, uh, particularly for those who we now consider or now have learned to be essential workers. What is the pandemic saying to us? We conducted business differently. We still do as we're doing it right now, lessening our carbon footprint. I did not drive my Yukon XL all the way to Ann Arbor. Uh, and I'm sitting here in my office, which means uh, I've contributed to lessening the carbon footprint. It's happening. What is the pandemic saying to us? Um, we learned all across this country that we could deploy a universal income. How about that? Everybody got unemployment. Anybody who wanted it, got it. Anybody who needed it, got it. It happened. We also learned and we also saw that although there was no political will for uh, a child care or income child care tax credit, that Luke Schaefer, the director of Poly Solutions, helped craft and put together. We also got that now, and there's great possibility we'll have it longer in the future. We also learned that, uh, you know, suits and clothing have no real purpose because all we need to do is make sure we protect this right here. As long as we protect this, we're in good shape. So the effects of the looming end are coming now. Moratoriums are being reversed everywhere. Workers are being lured back to work. Uh, in many cases, many people feel in unsafe working to con uh, conditions. In fact, most recently here, the Chicago Teachers Union uh, just came back off of strike as they uh, worked diligently and negotiated for uh, more safety precautions to be put in place. So as we think about the COVID-19 pandemic, urbanization, and Dr. King's call for this maladjustment. Um, we kind of have a charge, I think, as social scientists. I think we have a charge that King would suggest is the creative maladjustment. We have to look at what we saw happen in the pandemic that moved the needle in so many ways that we never could have moved without a pandemic. Use that data. And as we see the end come to this pandemic, and as we see all of those beautiful things that we saw that get reversed, we're going to have to tell that story about this phenomenological moment that we heard that suggests that we were going in the wrong direction and we had adjusted to going in the wrong direction. We had adjusted, imagine a society that had adjusted to painting blue stripes in front of people yards and going up to a house and shutting off water when children are right there in the house. We had adjusted to that. We've adjusted to just, if you don't make any money, you just survive the best way you can. We had adjusted to that. We had adjusted to driving down streets and seeing people's toys and furniture sitting out in front of the house. We had adjusted to that. I don't want to adjust to those things. And as Dr. King suggests, we ought to have a creative maladjustment. We ought to have an, a maladjustment to many of the issues that we face in urbanized America. And we must hear from the land that's speaking to us. Because I'm, I'm afraid that the land gave us something over the last couple of years that we thought we couldn't stand. But I think James Baldwin said it best. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Charles. I'm going to turn it over to our last panelist, Ms. Bernstein. Thank you, Sergeant, and uh, thank you, um, Charles, for um, your your call to action um, in terms of what we we need to do. Um, I'm Kristen Seafelt. I'm going to talk a little bit today um, about poverty solutions and a, a slice of our work in Detroit. But in doing so, I think I'm going to pick up on some of the issues and themes that other speakers have um, brought up, issues around housing, um, issues around transportation. And you know, as, as Charles um, just said, you know, the importance of listening. Um, so just as uh, a little bit of background for those of you who may not be familiar with Poverty Solutions, we're in our sixth year, we're a university-wide initiative um, founded to really conduct action-based research partnership with policymakers and other community partners to develop and implement uh, ways to prevent and alleviate poverty. And the partnership piece is really key to our, our mission and what this, ends up meaning is that we might do research that looks a little bit and is a little bit different from uh, traditional uh, academic models, although we certainly draw upon um, the you know, social science research uh, in, in much of our work. Um, when I think about you know, some of uh, the, the work that we're doing, I you know, wanna talk a little bit about um, our partnership on economic mobility and, this is an example of uh, uh, work that we're sort of doing that we're doing directly with the city of, of Detroit, where we advise city officials on evidence-based strategies. Um, we provide a lot of technical assistance and data analysis. Um, we've had uh, fellows placed within city government in different departments and, and units. Um, we're in the process of evaluating several different city initiatives. Um, and we do a lot of um, policy analysis and try to provide capacity to the city of, of Detroit. Um, but we also do a lot of community-based research and, and partnership. And this is what I really wanna uh, focus on today. Um, similar to our work with um, the city, we also provide technical assistance and connections to researchers at U of M and data um, directly to um, community organizations. We hold community conversations and events and provide grant opportunities. Um, and one of the um, sort of, I think, signature um, pieces of work that we did that, that really, I think, showcases our, some of our community-based research um, is our investing in us report, um, which I want to acknowledge my colleague um, Afton Branch Wilson, who did a lot of the heavy lifting on, on this report. And what we were really trying to do here is say, what do Detroiters see as some of the challenges that um, face them? And what are some of their suggestions uh, for moving forward? Um, Rather than um, undertake a survey, in part, in large part because DMAX is already doing such a fantastic job um, really tapping into um, you know, what Detroiters want to see for the city, there's already been a lot of work done. Um, Detroiters have been talking about what they want for their city and, and what they see as their challenges for decades now. And I think it's really um, kind of up to us to to be the ones to, to listen. So for this project, we looked at um, 29 neighborhood reports, 60 citywide plans um, authored by a variety of different um, entities, including um, city government, grassroots organizations, um, and also reports um, written by neighborhood clubs. Um, we took a sample of news articles, to, YouTube videos, um, videos of city council meetings, um, and then also look at some academic journal articles and books that use qualitative interviews um, with Detroit residents. And we coded all of these to, to figure out sort of what were some of the major themes um, that the Detroiters um, were talking about. 
We subsequently then conducted 12 focus groups um, in neighborhoods that were sort of underrepresented by the, the different data points that, that we had through these other uh, sources. So I'll direct you to poverty.umich.edu to get the full report. Let me just highlight a couple of things um, you know, that I think relate to some of the um, themes that were um, highlighted in, in the movie itself. And not surprisingly um, to anyone who sort of knows uh, Southeast Michigan and, and Detroit in particular, transportation and transportation issues were uh, a big theme that, that came up. And um, I think if Alex were to um, implement her transportation security index in the city of Detroit, there probably would be pretty high rates of, of, um, of this type of insecurity. You know, so one of our one uh, residents said, you know, Amazon's hiring, but it's on 17 mile in Vancouver and I'm all the way east. Um, I might wing it and do the two hour bus ride to get there, but now I'm off at work at 1130 at night and the buses stop running. I don't get that last bus. Well, right, if you don't get that last bus, you're not going home. Um, Detroiters, uh, in addition to um, you know, wanting better transportation, also wanted a voice in, in um, transportation planning. So there was a lot of discussion about participatory processes in transportation planning. Um, also, you know, wanted neighborhood car sharing um, and thought that the city could maybe implement some programs that would allow for this as well. Lydia already highlighted some of the um, issues you know, that Detroiters face with, um, with home repairs. And I think this quote from a Detroit renter um, you know, summarizes some of, some of the challenges. Animals um, not paying anything toward the water bill, not doing any, any repairs. Um, many residents called for better enforcement of tenant rights and also training and legal assistance to renters so that they could um, advocate for themselves um, and sort of understand some of the, the um, legal jargon that was um, often working not in their favor. They also called for um, more develop, economic development to be done by community organizations and not just for-profit developers um, so that the investment um, would really be towards the city and not toward, just toward profits. I think one of the um, more interesting aspects um, of the report is the uh, discussion about where residents really talked about wanting um, power for themselves. And um, in, the, uh, in Urbanize, there was a, you know, some clips about urban farming, but one resident um, uh, talked about uh, engaging in farming as a form of self-determination and that it's important um, you know, for, for us to create for ourselves and define our own realities. Um, there's lots of entrepreneurship going on in Detroit, but there's also a lot of barriers um, that are put in place um, you know, to, you know, towards people who want to start up their own business. And um, Detroiters called for a lot more technical assistance in, in things like navigating the business permitting process. Um, they also wanted um, ways in which they could compete with developers to obtain vacant land and, and buildings, you know, so that city residents could could have these parcels and not just um, out of town developers. And they thought the city could do more to actually promote cooperative business ownership so that people um, were not just on their own to try to start up their own, own business. So similar um, you know, to, to calls for um, technical assistance and, and help navigating things like a permitting process, Detroiters also talked a lot about information gaps. As this um, resident said, it's not easy to maneuver. And if you don't know who to contact for what, a lot of people end up calling the wrong people. Then they just get discouraged. So you have a city full of discouraged residents. Um, to rectify this, um, 
residents called for um, things like um, physical and mobile community information hubs. They thought that given um, the digital divide in Detroit, having, um, you know, forcing people to rely on the internet to find information was just not feasible and information should be right there in the community. And some of that might be um, accomplished by having more face-to-face -face and, and door-to-door -door outreach. So these are just a, a few of the, the main themes that came through um, in, uh, in our research. Um, but in closing, I, I want to just highlight that one of the things um, we've been trying to do uh, in our work at Poverty in Poverty Solutions is really think about the role of historical and ongoing racism. And as this Detroiter said, you know, anytime Detroit is mentioned, it's always the murder capital, the poverty capital. Um, they always have horrible stories about the neighborhoods, and that's based on institutional racism. The fact that when you talk about Detroit, you don't talk about the fact that there are 200 active community groups in the city fighting to make better outcomes for us. And if we don't sort of grapple with this, you know, we won't, um, when we think about regional transit systems as a way to combat some of the, the mismatch in jobs uh, and opportunity, you know, we, we won't sort of think about that racism in itself is what has kept the transit system from being regional. Racism and racist policies give the edge to for profit developers over, over community groups. And racism and privilege, you know, kind of keep uh, certain groups from having information and, and hoarding it and keeping it from other people. So I think, you know, when we're, when we're talking about uh, doing work in urban areas that are, are predominantly um, uh, uh, with residents of, of color, we really need to grapple with, with this issue. Um, it's built into the environment it's, itself. So with that, um, I'll end and, and turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Kristen, and all of our fabulous panelists for really, really striking and different takes on some of these um, issues that, that are overlapping and underlying persistent inequalities. I'm just gonna note we had a question in the Q&A. I think panelists, if you click on the button, you can see it yourself. It's an open question from James Perkinson. So I'll read it. One possible message of the coronavirus to our species is a biospheric demand for limitation of our impact at every level, beginning with extractive production and consumption. Is middle-class lifestyle killing the planet? And what might indigenous communities counsel as an alternative to the quote unquote fire that Charles referenced um, and what this uh, speaker is saying um, might be represented by planetary or, or global climate change and warming. So obviously rolling in on us as Baldwin prophesied. And I wonder if any of the panelists would like to, to remark on that, maybe um, uh, any of you, I, I think it would be open. Well, I just want to I, I, I just want to say that uh, I mean I think it's obvious that uh, we it's a, one of those things where we constantly battle uh, you know the the comforts of our lifestyle and then what we're doing at the very same time to uh, to promote our lifestyle that might be hurting us the our lifespan right. Uh, and I, and I think that's just a, con that's a consistent challenge that, uh, you know, in listening to the earth and listening to uh, what we would maybe consider the indigenous populations, um, we have to figure out how we can do it differently, just like we figured out so many other things. I mean, I guess my, my takeaway from, from urbanized in relationship to how the social sciences should act is act in social justice is that we really have to figure out how, how we cannot rubber stamp what's already happening, but more importantly, speak to why it's detrimentally important for us to do things differently. 
I think that's a great point, Charles. And I think that um, all of you have touched on the importance of speaking to folks that are living in the places um, at the time. And that was a theme that came up in the movie too, in terms of, for example, building social housing, having highly educated folks who've never lived in um, an urban space that isn't well served by infrastructure, um, we might make very different choices or policies and, and ignoring the voices of folks that have been um, solving problems for themselves for a long time. We do that at our peril. So I am so grateful to these panelists. I know they're all public faces here at the University of Michigan. And if you'd like to be in touch with anybody, I'm sure I can make that happen. But I'd really like to thank the audience for joining us and, um, and thank you all for, for thinking hard about the work that we all need to be doing to move forward on these really stubborn and critical issues. Thanks everyone so much for participating.